why college in America is broken, and what you can do to fix it. It's Brian Preston, the money guy. Yeah, Brian, I am excited to talk about this because I feel like this is a hot button topic. Anyone who has children, is thinking about having children, has recently had children, or is in college and recently come through college, they recognize, man, there's something going on right now that feels a little bit different. And a lot of people are questioning, is this the way it's supposed to be? Is the outcome that we're facing right now the outcome that's supposed to be as it relates to higher education? So we want to weigh into that. Well, I've got some... um a direct connection with this topic today. You know, I just had a, my daughter graduate high school. Um, I, what's funny is we had the whole family come stay with us for that graduation, and I have a, a niece and nephew. And my niece, we were working through with my sister-in-law filing last year's taxes, trying to figure out how do you take advantage of the the, the tax credits for education, who should claim it, and so forth. And I was like, wow, this thing is all around me. And then anybody who's had a senior in high school – Student, you probably had the same shock and awe experience I did is that when you see how much literature and advertisements that colleges send you, you're like, whoa, they're marketing this thing like it's a timeshare time, to yeah. a degree. And then and then now that my daughter's graduated, I'm getting marketed student loans at the same pace and level that I was on colleges for my daughter. I'd be curious if others have the same experience because, you know, I'm fortunate my daughter did really good in high mm-hmm. school. I, you know, y'all know I, y'all went on air right as I found out she got a big scholarship, mm-hmm. you know, a few months back. So I'd be curious, are all the other parents also having the same experience where – you're just shocked at how much literature of marketing and selling that colleges are doing. So it makes you wonder, what's what's going on in, in colleges on, on campus all across America? Yeah, it's really interesting, Brian, because you had said that about all the pamphlets coming. And I remember that when I was a senior, they started showing I don't remember the student loan part, though. Like, I don't remember mm-hmm. getting uh, flyers of people saying, hey, here's how you borrow money. Here's how you take some loans. Here's how you... I, I, and so even just, you know, how, however long ago it was when I was in school... It's changed even so much since then, because I don't think that was as common as what you're seeing right now. So it makes sense. Let's talk about, okay, what is the current state of college education, of higher education right now? And it's really, really interesting. If you look at the price of public universities, so this is four-year public universities, including room and board, from 1971 all the way through now, 2021. So what's that? A 50-year period, right? Public college costs have gone up. 1,509% 1,509% since 97. So it's gotten more expensive, both in nominal as well as in real dollars, just to go to school, just to go get a higher education. Well, and it's easy to kind of point this out and talk about how bad this is for all of our students and parents and grandparents that are all part of We're in this together. But here's what I think is going to be unique about our take on this, Bo. We're going to go through the history of what caused a lot of these big uptakes. And then I instead of just being throwing popcorn down from the, you know, the the cheap seats telling people how horrible the situation is right now, we're actually going to tell you how to navigate this in a very positive way. But I do want to kind of continue on this path of giving context mm-hmm. to the topic because man, that, that's an eye opener hearing that we're up fifteen hundred percent since nineteen seventy one. What else is going on for college graduates? Yeah, so when we think about what does a college graduate look like today, and this this data is from College Board and US Today. The average debt for those with student loans, so folks that end up taking out student loans for college, the average debt for a graduate coming out of school is $28,400. 66% of public college graduates graduate with student loans. So two-thirds of the folks coming out of college have loans. And then the average starting salary is about $55,000 per year for a college graduate. So Immediately, there is one bright spot yeah. that I see here, Brian. You know, you hear, you know that our rule of thumb we always talk about when it comes to like taking out loans is we don't really want you to co- accumulate more debt than your first year starting salary. Well, if the average starting salary is fifty five thousand and the average student loan debt that a graduate's graduating with is twenty eight thousand, that seems like it's okay, right? It's in the all right ballpark, at least relative to what starting salaries are across the country. Yeah, I, but I think that the people getting that fifty-five thousand, a lot of them probably are, you know, hitting the, actually sticking the landing of mm-hmm. leaving college, working in their field of major. I was shocked to learn seventy-three percent of people who get go start working 
don't actually work in their field of study. They don't actually they, they graduate college and they don't even work in their field of study. That that shocks me. You you said it best, Bo, in in, in our show prep. It's like one in four is essentially That's working right. with their college major. So That's be right. be a little more driven on how active and how your choices you're going to make on college. And by the way, we have some great data coming up on tools that you can use to help you choose those majors as well. Now, I think it's interesting, Brian. Now, this is some I actually learned a lot as we were kind of working through the pre-show prep, getting ready for this. Because we started asking the question, you know, what caused this? What what was the reason if college from 1971 until now has gone up 1,500% in terms of cost, what were some of the things that caused it? Because it looked like up until the late 1970s, college was affordable, but then something happened. Something changed, and it all, it's almost like it changed the entire system. Yeah, I mean, this is this is that whole discussion on unintended consequences. I mean, I think that we, we, so often you hear the road to H-E, crooked letter, crooked letter, <laughs> is paved with good <laughs> intentions. I think that a lot of times... You see this education, because we, we are big proponents of education, mm-hmm. talking about holding the ladder of opportunity, helping people better. We both come from pretty humble beginnings, yep. but education was my path up into a better future. And it breaks my heart when I see this, this very much value-add thing that has tons of tr- goodwill throughout the ages is actually starting to cause where it, it hangs around people mm-hmm. like a weight. Mm-hmm. So I, that's why I did want to go back and look at the history of what has changed since the 70s. When Because if you look at from pre-mid-1970s, education was pretty flat. Mm-hmm. It was, And we're going to show you a case study to prove our example on this. There was even some ticks down on education, but I think it was doing such a good job that the government said, hey, let's make this super affordable mm-hmm. for more people. And that's a great, noble cause. But what happened? And we actually have done the research on this. And for every dollar that the government has pumped into education, it looks like there's an unintended consequence with Yeah, it. so there was actually a piece of legislation that happened, and I think this was in the late 70s, 1978, called the Middle Income Student Assistance Act. And what it basically did is it brought onto the scene this idea of financial aid to help students pay to go to college. It was relatively inexistent prior to that. So more and more students with the change of legislation became eligible for student aid and ways to help them pay to go to college, which in theory sounds like a great thing, right? You want your students to be able to go to college. You want to open the door so that more people can get and do that. But here is the problem. You already alluded to this, Brian. The unintended consequence was universities, higher educational institutions started increasing prices. And you just said this, for every $1 increase in financial aid that takes place, tuition at universities goes up by about 65 cents. So it was not like they introduced financial aid so that more people could get into the present prices. They introduced financial aid, and then prices for the actual education itself started going up. Yeah, I, I, I probed Daniel a little bit more on this, and I said, hey, okay, so what percentage of the student population gets financial aid? Mm-hmm. And it worked out to be a, a little over 40%. But if you think about it, so 40% gets a dollar mm-hmm. of, of aid from the government but 100% of the student population just absorbs this 65 cents increase, on every yeah. dollar. So this got very expensive very quickly. And a lot of you are like, you're like, I don't know if I buy into this. So we actually have the data. We wanted to kind of go a deep dive on this because this is a big thing to say. You don't see this covered in the press. You don't see this covered anywhere because I think it's it's unpopular to say, hey, what unintended consequence mm-hmm. that was very noble in its design has actually created a lot of bad ripple effects that now our children and our grandchildren are probably going to look at education Mm -hmm. and colleges, higher education, with a completely different mindset than I looked at when college was $3,000 a year for tuition. It's different now, and we wanted to kind of show you that case study of how this all works. Yeah, and I think what's really interesting, you already sort of alluded to this, Brian, but back in the 70s, before the Middle Income Assistance, uh, Middle Income Student Assistance Act was passed, college costs were actually decreasing. There was actually a, a, a period of time up until 1978 where it was getting more and more affordable to go to college, introduce financial aid, and then college costs have now skyrocketed. They have kind of blown through the roof, 142% in inflation-adjusted dollars. And so then the question becomes, okay, how does this affect the average student? How does this affect the average American? 
What changed in terms of individuals' ability to actually go to school and go to college now? Yeah, and I think that, because uh, I want to give Daniel credit on this research he did, it was because a lot of people who were watching this on YouTube, you look at this and go, man, it, it, according to this, if, if we inflated and adjusted the price of education up to what it was, to what it would be if we, this was reasonable with where it went up, I think a lot of people would look at this and go, man, I wish I could send my kids to college mm-hmm. for about you know, nine to eight to nine thousand dollars a year, because that's what it should be. If if education had just gone up like inflation, instead of it being you know right under twenty five thousand dollars a year, it should be right under ten thousand dollars a year. And we wanted to kind of show you. I I wanted to go a step deeper with this and say, okay, let's take into account because that. So a lot of you go, what? Well, give me some context on that. So let's take into account minimum wage. How much of a minimum wage job would you have to work back in the 70s to pay for college versus where we are now? And it's going to shock you what we found. Yeah, in 1978, a student earning the minimum wage, which in 1978, Brian, you remember 78, uh, minimum (laughs) wage was $2.65 an hour. They would need to work 15 and a half hours per week to pay for college, right? So that's a part-time job. It's not a full work week. It's less than half. Uh, less than half of a full-time work week. So there was this idea that you, theoretically you could go to school and you could have a part-time job and you could pay your way through school. Well, fast forward now, in 2021, a student earning the minimum wage at the time of $7.25 would, $7.25, would need to work 60 hours a week to pay for college. No longer a part-time job, even more than a full-time job. So something has changed to where this thing that was attainable, that someone who maybe didn't come from, uh, you know, from wealthy parents, didn't have a strong background, they could at least, you know, pull themselves up by the bootstraps and they could go get a job and they could work and they could put themselves through school. That is a much different, more difficult thing to do now than it was 30, 40, 50 years yeah, ago. Yeah, I mean, because just, just thinking about 15 hours a week, a lot of people, you could go work, as you said, a part-time job, mm-hmm. still have a, a complete enjoy your college experience. That seems very healthy. Yep. Now, and a lot of you, I, I, I could I could sense you're probably sitting out there and you say, okay, seven and a quarter. I know that's minimal. That's the federal minimum mm-hmm. wage, but nobody's actually making seven and a quarter now. So we even pushed it up to, to $10 an hour to see what that did to this calculation. And guess what? It still worked out to be over 43 hours a week. Still you would have to time, work yeah. full time, which is impossible because I can't imagine working a full time job and then doing a full load at college. It's just, this is why I'm telling you for years younger people right now, you're carrying a bigger weight than what was pushed on people for the higher education in the past. And there's got to be some pushback on this. There's got to be some change at some point to to address this. And that's one of the things we we wanted to to talk about it, because I think that, and look, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this. But it is interesting to me that we're having a lot of discussion about student loan mm-hmm. debt. And I don't even know if I'm against this $10,000 provision that's been thrown out there of helping give some relief. But I do want to draw attention to the fact that educational institutions, endowments in the 1990s, if you added them all up, was $60 billion. Mm-hmm. If you fast forward to where endowments are now, they're just under a trillion dollars. They were like right at six hundred and ninety-one mm-hmm. billion dollars. So we've had a tenfold increase in the endowment. So colleges have gotten very wealthy off of a lot of this mm-hmm. financial aid and the uh, and the tuition increases and the cost. So if we are going to talk about a solution long term, that needs to be addressed as well because otherwise it's just a bail out this one time thing and then the colleges don't change their behaviors. That is obviously having a direct impact on our students. And that's what breaks my heart. Because like I said, this thing that's a ladder on your way out, education is your way out, they're they're, they're kind of blowing it in a lot of ways because I think that we're finding more and more often you do not have to go to college because you're, you, you strap how much this costs compared to the benefits you get. And you're like, I don't know if this makes sense. And that's why I did want to kind of transition to talk about, hey, where does ROI, where do 529s and other things fit into this? Yeah, so what are some things that you need to know, right? Obviously, so we've, we've identified there's a, I'm going to say a systemic problem, right? We only have so much influence in our ability to make big systematic changes. So what are the things that we can change instead of, like Brian said, being the 
popcorn throwers from the cheap seats. What are the things we can think about to help influence, to help uh, make the best of the circumstance that we have? And one of the ways is how you save for college. Uh, if you've listened for our show for any period of time, you know that we absolutely love 529 plans to save for college because they're great. You put money in, the money grows tax deferred, meaning you don't pay tax on that money while it's growing. And then when you go to pull it out, so long as it's used for qualified higher educational expenses, which is wide ranging now, not only is it tuition for colleges, but there's vocations, there's trade schools, you can even use it for K through 12 private. If you use it for those qualified educational expenses, then it's completely tax free. So it's a really, really tax efficient way to go about saving for college. So then the question that people naturally ask, all right, in, I like it, I wanna do a 529, how do I do it? Where do I do it? What do I need to know about specifically about 529? Yeah, and, and we do. We get very excited about 529s. We even it's part of our financial order of operations. We do say this is a step eight feature yep. because we want you saving for your retirement first. You know, it's back to the oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on your children. Right. So you want to make sure you're on stable ground. But it is one of those things where 529s have gotten a lot of attention also from our legislators and the fact that they've expanded mm -hmm. their benefits, trade school, K through 12. But we like uh, there's several resources. I like savingforcollege.com is sure. a great website. I also like that Morningstar rates there and ranks some of the top 529s. Every year they come out with an updated study. And But I got to tell you, the names that sit at the top are pretty consistent. Pretty and, and, yeah. the, and the three that, that kind of stick out is Illinois has a, a bright start college savings plan. Now, now here's something I do want to draw attention to people. States can have multiple 529s. Right. So make sure you pay attention to which one we're talking about because there are differences. Because I know Illinois has multiple 529 yep. plans, but the one we're talking about that Morningstar raves about every year is Illinois, Illinois Bright, Start. Bright Start College Savings. It looks like Michigan. I'm not as familiar with that Michigan Education Savings Program, mm -hmm. but one that shows up, I feel like, every year since 529s kind of came to be is the Utah, the Utah plan, My yeah. 529 plan. I believe Vanguard is, the, is, yep. the, is the, the provider on that plan. Pay attention to those things. I think you'll see that there's a lot of opportunities. And here's what they use in that criteria is that, hey, how well researched are, are, is the asset allocation approach? How robust are the investments? What are the costs? Mm -hmm. You know, so you have a really strong options, low internal expenses, minimal fees. Mm -hmm. This is the stuff that, that that leads to a very robust 529 offering. And so Morningstar does this great job of classifying them and giving them ratings and letting you know which ones are good. But the question you may have is, how do I know? Like, how do I know? what 529 plan is the best for me. So we think before you decide on a plan, there are a few questions you need to ask. And one of the easiest questions that we think makes sense to ask at the very front end of your 529 investigation is, is there a tax benefit in the state that I live in to participate in the plan sponsored by the state? And we found this great chart that shows a very simple case study around tax benefits from state 529 plans. And this is what it said. It says, this assumes there's a couple who file a joint return, making $100,000 a year in taxable income, contributing $100 a month to two 529s for each of their kids. Uh, and then the calculations make some tax return assumptions. And it basically says, okay, if this is a Georgia resident with this profile that participates in Georgia, this is what their tax benefit will be. If this person lives in Illinois, this is their tax benefit. If this person lives in Colorado, this is their tax benefit. This is a really neat tool to use to figure out, okay, based on where I live, does it make sense for me to use a 529 in the state that I live in? For you and I, Brian, we both used to live in Georgia, so we would always use the Georgia 529 plan because there's a state tax deduction to do that. Now that we live in Tennessee, where there is no state income tax, there's no tax benefit, we're no longer captive to a state plan, so we can go anywhere out in the country. You know, for my girls, just like you said, because it's a perennial top one, I use the Utah plan. A lot of folks in Tennessee like to use the New Hampshire plan because it's housed at Fidelity and it's super, super low cost. So you need to answer the question, is there a reason for me to stay in my state 
because my state has a specific tax benefit I should take advantage well, of. Well, and I want to give you credit, Bo. You found, uh, you and Daniel worked while I was out of town and found this great chart that shows the tax benefit by mm-hmm. state. Um, for those that are listening on podcasts, though, I want to make sure we give them some clarity on this. P- feel free to go to, and check this out. If you go to moneyguy.com, mm-hmm. you can actually, we have link backs to all of our videos. But if you just in case you're riding, exercising, cutting the grass or whatever, as Bo shared, if you live in a, a, a state that doesn't have an income tax, okay, it's, there's probably not going to be any benefits for you. Um, the ones that I would draw your attention to is if you live in, because there's only a few of them that really offer no benefit, that's really your California, your Kentucky, your North Carolina, your Maine, um, and I think there's Delaware on there. Those are ones that offer no deductions mm-hmm. in the state plan, so you probably still go want to shop around to get the best plan. But for everybody else, if you, so if you don't live in a tax-free state or you don't live in one of those states that I just – that are obviously struggling to, 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 to really create a, an offering or an incentive for people to save for college, you more than likely live in a state that has a pretty strong benefit. Yep. So you need to go check it out. Um, that's where a, a resource like Saving for College could be very valuable for you because you could become um, – look at your specific state to see what opportunities are. But there is a catch, Bo, and yep. I want you to walk people through because you mentioned we both grew up in the state of Georgia – I have my daughters were both born in the state of Georgia, and I set up 529s there. And I can tell you right now, I still have 529s in the state of Georgia because of this provision. So it actually worked. This is the reason that they put these provisions in place: is that a lot of these 529s, if you took a tax deduction, they don't want you to to, to take that deduction and then leave the state. They want you to keep the assets in those plans. So you need to be careful of these clawback provisions. Yeah, number of states. If you try to move, I mean, phrase it, we live in a world now where we move. We don't yeah. necessarily live in one state for our child's entire childhood. So they might live in a number of different states. If you were participating in a state's plan and receiving a benefit, you need to be aware if it's a recapture state, like the state of Georgia is. And what that means is if you move to another state and you try to roll the 529 from the Georgia plan into another state's plan, you might actually have to pay back the tax benefit that you receive. So if you're out there on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitch, or any of the audio places, we have a map right here that shows states where you can go anywhere. You can literally uh, take your money anywhere you want to do. We have the states where you can get a state tax deduction, but when you leave, you can take the money with you. And then we have the ones you got to be careful of, the recapture states, the ones that will claw back that benefit. So you kind of need to answer two questions. One question is, does it make sense for me to participate in the state in which I live? And the second question is, is if my circumstances change and I move to another part of the country, is this a plan that I can take with me? Or just like Brian has done, is this a plan I should leave behind? And there's nothing wrong with leaving it behind. You can still use the funds at any college across the country. It's not like if you have a Georgia plan, your kid has to go to college in Georgia, although they might want to because University of Georgia is amazing. <laughs> but you can use those funds for anywhere else in the world that, or anywhere else that has qualified educational expenses for your kids. So you need to answer those too. If you live in a state like Tennessee or a state like Texas where there's no tax incentive, there's no tax benefit, there's some other questions you need to think through. What's the lowest cost provider? Where are my other assets at? What are the ones that are easy to use from an interface standpoint? And again, I think Morningstar and those lists is a great place to utilize those resources to figure out which plan might make the most sense for you. So we've kind of talked about, hey, what's the best vehicles? We love 529 savings plans. Um, We've talked about ways that this could actually be a tax benefit for you. I want to kind of pivot to the the big decision because you, you've you've heard me. What's funny is I have to be careful because I've had people call me out because I knew some of the private conversations <laughs> that I've had on these topics. But it's degree ROI because I think it's kind of cruel that we say, hey, pay attention to what you major in. So if you have a a child, or you're maybe you're the student yourself, or you have a grandchild. This is why this hits so many. We all have relatives or friends or somebody we know that's trying to navigate making these good decisions. You need to know what's the return on investment you can anticipate from that degree. Because nothing breaks my heart more is to hear somebody go out of state to a college that's going to cost like thirty five thousand dollars or more, and then choose a major that just does not have the potential to have return on investment. It would be one thing if they had a 100% ride Mm -hmm. to really pursue that passion, but if you don't begin with the end in mind, you might be setting yourself up. Even if you are 
choosing your passion and going after something you really care about, there might be a better financial way to structure it so you don't trap yourself. I think that's a perfect disclaimer. Uh, I want to tell you guys what we did not just say. We did not say, hey, only pick a major that's going to pay you a lot of money. Only yeah. go find something. No. When you decide on the college that you're going to go to, make sure that the cost you're going to pay for the education you receive is justified. If you want to go into a unique, very specific major because it's what you're passionate about, what you love, that's great. Perhaps you don't have to go to the most expensive school in the country to do that. And it makes sense to have that conversation before you get to school to make sure you can make a sound and prudent decision. Well, I've been talking about this, and I'm fine-tuning as I go through it each time, is when I went through college, and this is what I tell everybody, be careful of the Hansel and Gretel effect. When I went to college, you went to college for the education, and the memories was kind of a... Uh, a a built-in benefit you got. It wasn't the cinder block walls that you lived Mm -hmm. in. It was the people, it was the education that gave the superpower to it. In this new modern world, because I see this got hit with the editing room floor while I was on vacation, I wanted Daniel to show that dorms now on campuses and some of the student support services and facilities they offer, it's like lazy rivers at college campuses (laughs) now, you know, where you you go to college now to be at an all-inclusive resort versus the education and the people, and that's why I just want you to be very, very careful with that decision on the major you choose, whether you go in-state versus out-of-state, because there's a huge difference in the cost structure there. And then, of course, the public versus private. Those things, each of those are decision points you need to really spend a lot of time you know, interpreting it and processing it to make sure you make the right decision so you land on your feet, you hit the ground running as soon as you leave education. Now, I, I know this at one time was the case, Brian, and so I'm going to, you're older, significantly older than I am, way <laughs> older than <laughs> I am. As you like to say. Um, but I want to ask you for some wisdom here, right? Because I think a lot of folks, college used to be the default, right? Like I got out of high school. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know my next step. I'm just going to kind of default to college. But back when college was more affordable and it was easier to do that, it was okay. It wouldn't set you back. I worry now that today's present day graduate, if their default is, oh, well, I'm just going to go to college. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to study. I don't know what I'm going to figure out. There's a chance that that default decision can have a price tag of tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars that you will take into the next 8, 10, 12, 15, 20 years of your life. I think you have to approach it a little more strategically, perhaps, than we had to approach it 20 years ago. Well, years it, ago. If, if, like you're, if you don't know where you're going and you just went to, because like here in Tennessee, you can go to a local community college and the state of Tennessee will actually cover your costs. It'll yep. be a full ride. I think there's nothing wrong because that that period of time where you're trying to figure out your next step, it doesn't hurt you financially. Mm-hmm. But for, we already know the stat that 73% of people do not actually go and join the workforce with using the college degree that they have. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people... You know, you have to ask yourself, like, I, you know, the example I've used in the past is had a friend who is saying that their child wants to go into broadcasting. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, do you even need to go to college <laughs> for that? I mean, because there's a lot of certifications and other things that you can do um, in this new modern world that might get you to the exact same place mm-hmm. without the six figures of student yep. loan debt that goes with it. And then we even went a, a step further, Bo, and, and I want to give you kudos because we're going to share a tool that a lot of you are about to spend a lot of time on. You're going because I found myself spending 20 minutes just poking around this website that Bo found. It's going to be a tremendous resource. So go ahead and get the pen and paper ready when we share this resource in a minute. But in the meantime, we wanted to show people what are some of the worst majors mm-hmm. you can do? What are some of the best majors? Because that return on investment, what you're paying for mm-hmm. education, you should go into that 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 whole experience knowing what you expect to get out of it on the other side. Now, and I want I want to clarify again because I don't want to come off as we're being mean or insensitive. These are not the worst college majors in terms of, oh, it doesn't make sense to do this. It's just based on what you can expect from an earnings th- uh, earning standpoint when you get out of school and how difficult it would be to pay off student loans if these are majors you pursue. And all this is from the uh, from the Brookings Institute. And this were these were some of the Worst college majors, uh, drama or theater. Based upon return based on upon investment. Based upon return on investment and paying off, not worse in terms of don't do this for a living. Uh, health and physical education, civilization, ethnic studies, composition, speech, fine arts, and nutrition and fitness. So 
If those are the worst, one of the questions you might have is, okay, what are some of the best in terms of highest ROI or easy to pay off student loans? Uh, engineering, nursing, operations and logistics, computer science, finance, economics, construction services, special needs education, and then, Brian, I know you're happy to see this one, <laughs> accounting and actuarial sciences. So you can kind of have this broad view of, all right, if I think my child is going to go into this field, does it have a higher ROI type number? Does it have a lower ROI type mm -hmm. number? But maybe you want to be really, really specific and really granular. Maybe you want to say, man, I think my kid wants to go to school at this school in this town to study this major. This is the tool that Brian was alluding to. Yeah, uh, this one kind of blew my mind when Bo presented this to the content team. You can see we put the logo on here. Um, it's it's F R E. OPP.org is the organization. That's the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity. Guys, this is going to blow your mind in the fact that you can go here, choose any college. I mean, we, we put all kind of colleges mm -hmm. in here, played around. We looked at every <laughs> member of the content team. We were able to put in the school and then go search for the major to see the ROI on each of our majors. So it lets you see the institution, it lets you see the majors, and then it lets you see their earnings at age 25. Or anticipated earnings at, at age 45, return on investment before completion adjustment, and then return on investment after completion, meaning you actually get the degree, right. and then return on investment adjusting for completion and underlying total all spending, the all the other things that come into play. Guys, this is a valuable resource. Because it's one thing for me to tell you, hey, begin with the end in mind. And you might go, that's great, guys, that y'all can give that general guidance. But how do I get into the actual minutia of data points mm -hmm. to make this decision, this is your answer. F-R-E-O-P-P dot O-R-G. Go take advantage of what is the financial value of my degree tool that they have available on their website. It's truly incredible. And this is how we use this practically. We have uh, clients whose children are thinking about going off to school or even family members. We'll actually show them this. Hey, what do you want to study? I want to study... Uh, I want to study theater. I want to do the drama. Okay, great. The University of Georgia may not be the best college for you. Let's find a more affordable university that has a higher ROI and better job placement opportunities with that degree. And you can really get kind of strategic in how you approach this decision. For a lot of 17, 18, 19-year-olds entering into college, this will probably be the largest, most expensive decision you make until it comes time to buy a house or something like that. So you want to make sure that you're going into it in an intelligent, well-thought-out manner, mm. just not willy-nilly. Because there is a big difference in a million-dollar ROI for a degree and a negative $200,000 ROI for a degree. Well, I think it's interesting just looking at how this website's set up. Mm -hmm. is in, We chose University of Georgia because we're both college grad, UGA grads, and so is Daniel from the content team. And I thought it was interesting. Like We chose drama. This, according to this, drama is going to have a negative return on investment of one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Meanwhile, computer engineering. So we chose one from the worst majors, one from the best, on, based upon return on investment. Computer engineering had a million seven uh -huh. positive benefits. So there's all a one close to one point two million dollars spread between those two degrees. Yep. That would be so valuable to know going in because if, if I was somebody, because look, drama, I was the drama kid in high school. You know, I I, yeah, I was. I, I did know, a, I did I a lot of I did a lot of drama in high school. It was something that I, that I would have probably, if I wasn't so nerdy with math and other things, that I would have probably because I loved that whole thing. Hence, while we're doing a podcast and other things, it lets me, you know, do my art kid stuff and dramatic <laughs> stuff on here. But I think it would have been very valuable because if I could have seen, hey, the ROI at the University of Georgia is actually a negative 160. Maybe the way you compensate, still pursue your passion, but maybe I should go to community college for the first two years so that I would enter into the major at the University of Georgia with two years already mm -hmm. under my belt with yep. zero debt and I would be in a better place. Or like Bo said, maybe University of Georgia is not the best place. Maybe we ought to go compare this to other colleges mm -hmm. in the surrounding area to see if they have a better ROI because it might be the fact that – because I know when I graduated with an accounting degree at Georgia, everybody who graduated with an accounting degree – had a job mm -hmm. already placed because that's where all the big accounting firms came and and grabbed all the graduates out of those programs. So it does matter where you go to school for yep. different majors because you might be a feeder program for certain industries 
pay attention to this tool. I'm going to repeat it once again. F R E O P P. Dot .org this is going to be the tool that actually lets you get into the minutia of that decision making go enjoy the hours you're now going to spend on this with your family friends and loved ones to make sure they're making the best decisions possible all right Brian so we've talked about what you can do before it's time for college like you can save you can choose your degree you can help educate your children let's talk about some of the things you can do while your child is in college and this is kind of you are the expert on this right now because you are literally living in no this moment right now, right? So there are a few things you can do while your kid is in college to help pay for it. One of the very first things we talked about were tax credits. Yeah, tax credits are, is, is, this came up recently. Like I said, I had all my family in town for um, the, my, my oldest daughter's high school graduation. And this came up because my sister-in-law was working through taxes. Mm -hmm. And, I, and as, as I've shared, I have a niece who's in, in college um, and I'm kind of hoping that down the road she might go into the wonderful world of finance. She doesn't. She probably gets tired of me nudging her that direction oh, I can't all the imagine time. You telling her I know. All the time. I'm very opinionated about things. But but here's the thing. I was trying to explain when we were looking at the different tax returns. I said, look, we have to coordinate 529s. We have to coordinate the tax credits because there's two big ones out there. There's the American Opportunity Tax Credit, which is considered the better of the two because it gives you much more benefit. And then there's the Lifetime Learning Tax mm -hmm. Credit. And I wanted to kind of give the quick overview of what these two tax credits are, and then we'll kind of close it out with how does this integrate with a 529 Great. plan? Because hopefully we've all been saving. So these American Opportunity Tax Credits are very powerful because here's the maximum benefit you can on the American Opportunity Tax Credit. It, you can get a $2,500 benefit on $4,000 of expenses. And the reason it works out, that math works that way, is that it's a dollar for dollar credit on the first $2,000 you spend for, for college. And then it's a 25% a, a expense on the next $2,000. So that's how you get to that $2,500 total credit. But you can imagine, so it doesn't, if you, it, it, at a minimum, you, there's no way in the world that you should do anything that blows up you getting to get this tax credit. Because mm -hmm. remember, a tax credit is different than a tax deduction. A tax deduction means it lowers your income, and then when they calculate calculate your tax rate tax rates, you're probably getting a 25 to 30 percent benefit mm -hmm. off of it. A tax credit is a dollar for dollar reduction in your actual taxes. So this is a huge valuable benefit. So pay attention to that American Opportunity Credit. It is available for the first four years that you're that you're in school. Now the lifetime learning credit, it's not as powerful. It's two thousand dollar maximum benefit, and the way it works out is it's twenty percent up to ten thousand dollars of expenses. It now. I said first four years on the American Opportunity Credit. Lifetime Learning Credit comes into account for somebody who maybe is going for graduate school or you're an older person that says, hey, I need to go back to college to retrain myself on things. You can use that Lifetime Learning Credit, but it's going, it's going to be 20%, not the dollar for dollar or 25% mm -hmm. of the next 2000 And here's another thing I think is interesting, and this is the part that happened with my sister-in-law and my niece, is we were trying to figure out who should take the credit. Mm. Who takes the credit? Does the student take the credit even if they're working out there full-time? Or do the parents who paid for it, and you do need to take this into account because the parent – in a lot of situations, they'll be able to take the full $2,500 because they have enough income to justify it. Whereas the child, like, because this was the case I had with my niece, she was only going to get a 40% refundable benefit. Because, you know, when you, you don't make a ton of money, you usually get back all the taxes mm -hmm. you paid, plus a little bit more if you have some of these credits, but you can only do four up to 40%. So this was going to be like an $800 benefit to my niece, but it could be a $2,500 benefit to my sister-in-law. Pay attention to this part. The refundable matters. By the way, lifetime learning credit, once again, it's just not as powerful because it, none of it can be refundable. So if you don't actually pay income taxes into the system, you're not going to get a benefit from this. So it, it's not refundable. Both of these have income phase-outs um, for, for the American Opportunity Credit. Eighty to ninety thousand dollars for single individuals. Married filing jointly is one sixty to one eighty is where those phase outs are for the lifetime learning credit. It's a good bit lower single individuals. It's fifty nine thousand to sixty nine thousand for married filing jointly. It's one eighteen to one thirty eight. And then here's the, the the big closeout on this. How does this all integrate into five twenty nine plans? 
you can use both 529s and tax credits, but not for the same dollars. Mm. So that's why I always remind people, hey, if you are going to qualify, your income is below the threshold, you have a child that's in the first four years of school, make sure you leave about $4,000 of expenses, of qualified education expenses, out there that's not reimbursed through the 529 plan so you can actually use both because if you use all of your maybe you did a great job of saving with the 529 and you have more than enough to pay for college you're going to be it's not a smart decision to pay for a hundred percent of college with that 529 because there's a good chance that the government through tax savings could have paid for a portion of that and still giving you a great benefit so make sure you're working through that compatibility and how to integrate that planning tool together so if I'm going to summarize what you just said it sounds like the American opportunity tax credit uh, is slightly better better larger benefit. Uh, with higher income limits, but the lifetime learning credit is available for unlimited number of years. So you can use it more than just in those first four. You can only claim one educated education tax credit per year. You can't do any double dipping on that, right? Right. Uh, and uh, you can't double dip in terms of five to nine expenses. So you have to use it for distinct expenses. So it takes a little bit of planning. This is probably something you want to think through, not on April 14th when you file your taxes, but probably back in August when you're actually paying for the college expenses, right? A little bit of forethought needs to go into it. Yeah, and I think like packing a punch like American Opportunity Credit, if you want to integrate that with a 529, you only have to, you only have to leave $4,000 out there for the government to qualify for that credit outside of your 529 reimbursement. Yep. Whereas the Lifetime Learning Credit, it's got to be 10000 because it's 20%. So there's, there's a big difference there on how much you have to leave not reimbursed from the 529. All right, so we talked about uh, tax credits, right? That's letting the government pay for a small portion of the cost of higher education. Another thing, and this is something that's like super, super, I mean, this is kind of the whole reason we're having this conversation, is financial aid. Now, uh, rather than going through a deep dive on financial aid and specifically on the FAFSA, we want to point you to a resource. If you go to fyi.moneyguide.com, Daniel did a full write-up. FTE Daniel did a full write-up on everything you need to know about the FAFSA, what you need to know, how to fill it out, tripwires to make sure you watch out for. So I would encourage you, if you do have a student who's getting close to or preparing to go off to school and you're thinking about financial aid, whether it be on the needs-based or merits-based side, go read Daniel's blog post on the FAFSA, and it'll be hugely valuable to kind of walk you through all the things that you need to know. Yeah, and a teaser just because I think this is important to give a little bit of information on this because I do encourage everybody to go to fyi.moneyguy.com to check out Daniel's deep dive. But a lot of you are probably saying, give us a li- some of the breadcrumbs on how 529s and mm-hmm. financial aid. I can tell you, Cliff Notes, 529s do have a direct impact on your financial yep. aid calculation, whether it's the the student or the the parents having those assets. So a lot of you, you know, a hack that you want to consider. Now there's some some caveats to this because it could impact the timing of this. And Bo, I don't know if you want to give how far you want to go on the breadcrumbs, but there is the grandparent 529 sure. hack and the fact that it doesn't, you know, they don't ask you about grandparent assets. But here's the catch. Pay attention to when you actually use those benefits Mm -hmm. from the grandparents. It does roll through this FAFSA calculation, so you might want to wait until that junior and senior year, and we explain that. I think Daniel might even lay that out in his um, Your Complete Guide to FAFSA Mm -hmm. um, write-up on it might make sense to to, to save those grandparents' money for reimbursement in in those second two years. Yeah, another thing, this is another little grandparent hack. Since we're talking about grandparents, you know, one of the things that I encourage – uh, my folks to do, right? If they ever want to make a contribution to my girls' 529s, maybe for birthdays or whatever. You know, I live in the state of Tennessee. There's no state tax benefit for contributions they make. It would make a lot more sense for their grandparents to open up 529s in the state that they file taxes in and make contributions into there so they can get a tax benefit. So that way, at least someone can get it. And if I kind of think through it, when my kid gets to college, I know those grandparent 529 assets won't be factored in the FAFSA calculation, and those will be the dollars we'll use for the last two years when it comes time for that. So I, I shared that these are unique times. You know, Everything just is getting more and more expensive. How in the world are we going to get our students through college 
um, or through whatever their education journey is. Because it doesn't, I had somebody post a comment that says education and college don't have to be the only path. You know, So I just want you to always to be a, a lifetime learner. But it is one of those things I wanted us to kind of close out with some out-of-the-box ways that you can navigate this, this expensive cost of education in very creative ways. And we actually have some case studies sure, yep. right here at Abound Wealth as well as with my own relatives. And I was so impressed, like my, my niece, she's a resident assistant. That's you know, great. And, and, and yep. one of the things when you get paid to be a resident assistant, you get your housing paid for. There's a lot of benefits. There's out-of-the-box thinking you can do. Um, and, and, and like I said, my niece being a resident assistant has really lowered the burden of one of the most expensive costs for education, which is housing. She took advantage of, hey, there's a need at colleges to have – students who are sophomores and beyond help the freshmen and and i think that's a very valuable thing and then we have a case study here with your roomie for the summer yeah that's right well uh, we have an intern right now who uh he's going to go back to get a graduate degree so we can sit for the cpa exam who would ever want to do that uh, but one of the things he figured out is that he can actually go be a graduate assistant and it will cover his tuition for the one additional year he needs in that accounting major so that's great he's going to have a free year of school just from serving as a graduate assistant so there are methods and mechanisms available to you to help offset the cost of college if you're willing to do a little bit extra. And then we we've, we've we've shared this hack already but I think it's worth mentioning, you know, your diploma when you graduate college, nobody ever asks you, "Hey, did you go all 4 years at that college or did you um just matters the did one you that do print commu- the paper?" Yeah, did you do community college first to kind of cut the the edge off of the cost because a lot of states do, you know, community college is substantially cheaper than the 4 year um, relative, and that you can still transfer. Actually, they prioritize a lot of the the, the, the community college transfers into the state mm-hmm. programs, and your diploma looks exactly yep. the same as everybody else. So that's a way to really cut the cost down dramatically. Also, and this is going to be a unique sh- um, shout out to um, a crosstown rival, you know, because um, we're both Georgia Bulldogs. Yeah, we are. But um, work study and co ops. So I knew a lot of people went to Georgia Tech Nerd. and they graduated. <laughs> Um, college without any student loans or other things because it wasn't uncommon starting around sophomore, junior year, you'd go take a co-op at an employer where you would kind of do um, a semester on in school and then a semester working for this employer. And if they liked you, part of the incentivizing to you to come join their company was they would just pay for the rest of your college. I knew a lot of people that were doing that. So work, study, and co-ops is a a tremendous opportunity. Live off campus. You know, you could always, I know uh, living in mom and dad's basement is not the greatest (laughs) thing, but there's definitely, if you can cut the edge off through being a resident assistant or living off campus, you might save yourself some money. Back when I was in college, you know, there were a lot of paid note takers. You know, pay attention to... If you're a great student and you're meticulous about your note taking, consider, hey, are there services around town that help people who are dyslexic or just helps the kids that don't want to study as hard as you? (laughs) There's ways to cut the edge off of getting paid for that. And then um, I even thought it was interesting. We'll we'll get to to tutoring and other things. I'll talk about that in a minute. But there's other ways you can do this as well with timing. Another really interesting is you can take classes during the summer or winter semester. A lot of people don't realize that those semesters are actually offered on an abbreviated scale, meaning you can get through the classes quicker, and a lot of times it's a lower cost. So if you have a few courses or credits that you need to knock out, rather than having to pay for an entire extra semester, you can take classes over the summer and winter. It's a great way to cut down the total cost of the education you're going to be receiving. And then we have employer tuition reimbursement. Daniel was quick to share with us that he worked at Publix mm-hmm. all through college, and they had a um, tuition reimbursement program for the grocery store chain. Yep. Um, I, I know my own daughter works at Chick-fil-A, and they have a similar program. And if you take into account what the tuition reimbursement, it's actually a great – I mean, you time. really boost that hourly pay when you take into account the, the, the noble cause of tuition reimbursement. And then here's the last one is uh, tutoring other college students. And I was very quick to share with the, the content team. I had to get tutoring in college. The uh, My senior year as an accounting major, 
I just couldn't make governmental accounting work. So I actually had to go hire <laughs> funny thing. No, um, a fellow can. student to help me on tutoring. And I actually, that's a, that's a bad, I, I'm actually proud of that. You know, that looking you at how our government, government is run and stuff now, I'm like, maybe I have too much common sense that that governmental accounting course just <laughs> never kicked in or made sense that, that I needed to get a little extra um, help on, on that. But so if you're, if you're great at some of those things, feel free to help other students. And you can even get paid to do that and um, help, you know, help cut the edge off of college. Yeah, here's the thing. College is a decision. You know, it's changing. It's rapidly changing. It was different when you came through, Brian. It was different when I came through, different when Daniel came through. It's going to be different when our kids go through. So what we have to do is make sure we're equipped to make the best decisions possible given the system in which we're operating. Right now, the tips that we've walked you through, thinking through, how am I going to save for it? How am I going to pay for it? How am I going to encourage my child or my student? Or how am I personally going to think about the degree that I go get? All of these decisions are going to have huge impacts on the rest of your life. So you should make sure you weigh them heavily to make sure you're making sound financial decisions that don't put you behind getting your jump started. Yeah, I, I still look at education as being a way out, an opportunity, but I do think we have gotten to the point now where you need to be much more deliberate with your planning. It's um, And, and it's a shame that we have to put something so heavy on people so young mm-hmm. um, because, once again, people who maybe don't have a, a don't come from a house where education was the, the driving factor, you're just not going to be able to navigate that as easily as yep. somebody where education was so powerful for the previous generation. So I hate that that's the point, but I'm just telling you, hopefully you found a source like the Money Guy Show or other things in these resources. We've given you now the tools that you can go ahead, begin with the end in mind, start running those plans, start preparing for where you want to be, because that's the way life is going to work as well, with your financial assets and everything. Whoever is actually putting in the work, preparing for where they want to be, it's back to that begin with the end in mind, you will be rewarded for that sacrifice and that commitment and that time that you put into it. So go use these resources and tools and turn education back into a benefit and the the, the, the starting blocks for your future successes so you don't have to be one of those case studies where people say, hey, the fork in the road moment that took out my financial future was this decision to go to school here or mm-hmm. to choose this major We've given you the tools to do this right. I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen, Money Guy Team, out.